This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. This week we have Steve Whitaker from the University of Sheffield. And uh, he's also had a lot of industrial experience before going to the university there. And was really one of the earliest people, one of the founders in the area called computer supported, computer -supported cooperative work. Um, which distinguishes itself to some extent from other areas of HCI because of his real focus on the social aspects. And over the years, it sort of evolved away from the workplace social aspects to looking at the larger picture of people and how they interact and how they live. Uh, and he's recently been looking at questions of memory, how we interact with our memories and how computers get into that. And that's what he'll be talking about today. Thanks very much. Um, I want to start off today by um, slightly parodying uh, a perspective or um, a vision that's coming out of Microsoft about uh, a future in which we recall, we capture and recall everything. Um, for those of you who actually read the technical work associated with that, you'll, you'll realize that what those people actually said is not how I'm going to present that, this stuff today. But the reason why I'm going to present it in this type of way is this work is being interpreted in a particular way, and it's the interpretation that I, I want to uh, examine and, and react against. But you'll see what I'm talking about uh, as I go along. So there's been a very interesting vision um, suggested by, uh, in particular, Gordon Bell, um, but also Jim Jamal from Microsoft, um, which is basically the notion that we could create a complete life log, log or record of every single piece of information we touched and every event we experienced. And this is a very attractive vision because I'm sure all of us are walking around thinking how terrible our everyday memories are. Terry and I, we, I wrote to him on Monday saying, I'm ready for the seminar on Friday. And what I'd forgotten to do was reply to an email he said, saying, here are some dates. I just mentally assumed that those dates were, were going through or whatever. Uh, and I don't have to belabor this point. We're all walking around. I can see you've got an annotation device there, sometimes known as a notebook. Maybe you're reading your email, but you, know, you could even be taking a few notes on things that I'm going to say. But we're doing this all the time, um, because we know that our, our organic memories, by which I mean the memories that we're carrying around in wetware, are fallible. So this is a very attractive vision because, you know, here's, here's a way out of our troubles. What I'm going to suggest is it's maybe not quite as straightforward as that. So I'm going to skip through all this stuff. We know all this. Everything's getting cheaper, smaller, faster. And one big trend is that, obviously, uh, the la what we've seen in the last 10 to 15 years is that retrieval of information is improving, although uh, we'll, I'll, I'll have to n nuance that um, assertion in a few minutes. And so from a storage perspective, um, this kind of stuff is no longer a problem. So if you, um, if you look at just the amount of speech that we're exposed to in a lifetime, or the amount of text that we're exposed to in a lifetime, back of the envelope type calculations suggest there is just no problem storing this. I mean, when you know, the last time, you know, uh, six gig was a problem for the last computer you bought. It's not a problem for the current PC you buy or even a laptop. And then even if we think about, you know, making important fashion statements, um, cyborg type fashion statements wandering around with, has anybody, does anybody do this kind of stuff? Right. Anyway, you know, I think there's, you know, you talk about fabrics next week, there's some design there's some life integration and design to go on here with this type of technology. But anyway, um, from the capture perspective, um, 
you know, these are approximations, but this type of amount of storage is not going to be problematic in 10 to 15 years for the average person because you've only got to think about Moore's law and you've only got to think about, you know, um, Terry, you know, could you ever have believed that we'd be walking around with thumb drives that were one gig or five gig or whatever? It's just, you know, that was just, we couldn't even think about that, right? So this is just not going to be a problem. So here's Gordon Bell, and that's his life. Right? And what he's trying to do is he's, going to, he's trying to be the alpha user. He's trying to get all his stuff digitally recorded. And he's not the only one. There's a, there's a bunch of technologies that are working along similar lines. Um, Sudo May's Stuff I've Seen, which integrates desktop, all desktop objects. There's the infrastructure work on Haystack that was done at MIT. And then there's various ways that we can stamp these kind of event logs of our lives in terms of locations, um, visual information. Very interesting project from Microsoft, the SenseCam. Everybody know the SenseCam? It takes a picture when, you, when you, your visual field changes. So if you move uh, or you orient towards uh, different light or darkness, a picture will be taken. The idea is you've got a kind of visual stamp of your life in terms of those images. Uh, there's also speech capture. Are you here? Right, OK. Um, so, so this is very interesting work, which is basically ubiquitous audio. And I guess you've got a company that's doing this right now. Yeah, OK. Um, and then there are very specialized uh, applications for particular domains, like the stuff that Patrick's doing. Uh, I'm going to introduce everybody at this rate, aren't I? Um, <laughs> so the stuff that Patrick's doing, which is a, a, a part of the Kalo project, which is trying to capture um, and analyze information in a very dedicated setting, uh, namely meetings. I guess you've done stuff on conversational capture too, right? OK. And the press loves this kind of stuff. They just absolutely love it. Um, the, the Daily Telegraph. But you know, here's IEEE Spectrum, which you know, I think should know a little bit better than this. And they're saying things like, um, you know, humankind's strategy has been to rely less and less on actually remembering and more and more on being able to find something when we need it. The Gospels, Gutenberg, and Google have all been steps along the way. Blah, blah, blah. Right. So this is the kind of thing that I'm actually reacting against. Um, not, you know, the, vi the vision's interesting. It's, it's the implications of where this might lead us uh, that I want to examine slightly more critically today. So, so far, what I hope is I've convinced you that this is technically possible. We can record all this kind of stuff. But what's the kind of reality, and how might these types of archives actually be used? So what I want to do in the first part of the talk um, is to talk about problems with the vision as stated. And by the way, I'm happy to take questions about what I talk about. Um, if they become a big kind of sidebar, then, then I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Um, then I want to talk about. Um, design principles for what I want to call computer-mediated memory. And I don't like the term digital memories for reasons that have become obvious. And then I want to talk about some work that we've been doing um, at Sheffield, which is uh, trying to build new types of systems that address some of the problems that I'll talk in the first, uh, about in the first part. And then I'll talk about kind of far futures. So I want to just start off by presenting some um, empirical data from various studies that uh, ourselves and other people have done which show that there are various problems associated with this kind of capture everything perspective. And I want to talk about the fact that digital archives are often invisible, and I'll say what I mean about this. I'll talk about um, the fact that they can be inaccessible, and I'll also talk about problems that we as humans have in actually trying to organize stuff in order to predict future retrieval. Do you have a? Uh, uh, do you have a uh, strong distinction between, you might say, the logistical aspects of, of maintaining one of these long-term systems? For instance, when you talk about, yes, capacity is there, but, but batteries aren't, uh, for, for an instance. Uh, do, you, do you address that in any way, or, or is that just mere engineering? Um, I would want to demean it as, uh, as such. I mean, the, those kind of things are very important. I thought what you were going to talk about was kind of formats and long term. Uh, just a bit very basic. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. I apologize, but I'm not going to. Yeah. Um, okay, so the last thing I want to talk about there is, is the fact that 
often when we kind of prepare these types of materials long term, we don't actually see a payoff for, for what we end up saving. And, and sometimes we do the opposite, which is we don't save stuff that we should do. OK. So I'm very quickly to talk about um, a, a study that we just presented at CHI, um, which didn't come out the way that we expected, but it was interesting. So basically what we had people do was we had people walk through their house. So we're interested in the question of what makes a significant memory for people. And so one of the things that we're interested in was uh, what objects in their environment people consider to be very salient as mementos. And what we had people do was walk through different rooms of their house um, and select various types of things from their home, explain how and why they have mnemonic significance. And uh, the reason why this experiment, this study didn't work is we expected a large number of these objects to be digital because we picked a population that was uh, technically savvy. They all had digital cameras. Uh, most of them had video cameras. They all had at least uh, one laptop in the house. So they're familiar with all these types of technologies. Can anybody who wasn't at the paper tell me how many objects, digital objects, do you think they chose in, in their tour of the house as a whole population? So let's say there's 160 objects. How many of those were digital? Very close. Very close. <laughs> the answer is one. Right? And this is despite, and this is quite striking because when people are doing this kind of house tour, we watch them walk back and forth past their laptop, their computer, their racks of CDs, you know, uh, their analog um, tape recordings. And so we, we knew that people actually had significant digital archives, but they didn't actually choose to talk about this information. And um, one of the things we thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe when, when I say recency, you know, maybe this stuff that people want to talk about is from the far past and all this digital stuff's new. But when we actually profiled the chosen objects, and this is interesting from the point of view of um, memories in general, a lot of these were kind of memories in process. That's to say they were from the last couple of years. So it's not a recency problem. In terms of availability, there's a very interesting, so you can say, oh, well, there's stuff on your computer, you know, you somehow don't think about it, right? But what we found was with some of these other objects, at least 80% of these people picked a collection of objects. By a collection, I mean something like what's pictured here, um, which is something that's inside a container. And often, these containers were in the back of a wardrobe or, or, you know, deeply embedded in some kind of hidden place, right? So it wasn't like people weren't, you know, in the case of a computer, you can think, well, it's not sort of out there. It's not kind of visible, right? But in the case of these kind of objects or collections, people were projecting into a, an invisible space and they were retrieving these kinds of objects. So our contention is that in, in some sense, they're not significant in the same kind of way. So, so I guess not having the de details on your... Uh, imagine a very different result because it showed me an object. Because I don't people don't think of a digital file as a I mean, digital object. Or can you somehow replay for me an interesting event that happened? And then they would jump right to the digital thing because replay an event. So how much did the phrasing of the way you asked them really determine this? Well, so, so so then we had to modify what we're doing because the original study, we, we what we were trying to do was to look at the digital and the physical and compare them right, in terms of mnemonic significance. So what we did at the end of the interview was we said to them, oh, you know, now you've finished doing all that, have you actually got any digital mementos? And they said, you know, so, so there's your question, right? And they said, oh, no, well, maybe I've got some pictures, right? And then we said to them, well, do you keep emails from friends? Oh, yeah. Um, have you got any videos? But that, I still maintain that those, those things actually had to be primed and elicited in ways. And so then we could get into, uh, you know, so then halfway through somebody's showing us a bunch of videos and they say, oh, these videos, you know, these digital, they're so great. You know, they really engender what was, you know, but that really had to be striven for in a sense to get. So I, th I think there is, I, I, that was a concern I had, but I think this, I think it, this is, this is legitimate. 
that, that there is a, a genuine sense in which, and, and I guess you're talking about you know, classic CSCW. I've seen the same kind of thing in other settings like, um, you know, projects that try and organize in terms of all, you know, all software and, you know, notes and uh, Microsoft Project don't do as well as ones that kind of externalize things. And so, so I think, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's a repeated phenomenon here. Okay, so, so that's, that's the first kind of um, pointer in that space. Um, the second thing that we did was uh, we had people, different people, but again from the same kind of population, kind of ordinary people, we had them try and access um, their old pictures from their collections. So we had about uh, 20 users, these are parents of young families, and we talked to them about that, um, well we, we talked to them, I'll tell you, later, part way through the experiment we talked to them about the, the value of their pictures and all of them, as you, I guess all you would, would say, said that this, this stuff is really important to them. This is really significant information. And so before we told them the point of the study, we, uh, we talked to them a little bit about their lives. So we said to them, oh, you know, sort of what have you been doing recently? Um, you know, can you describe? So we talked to them about kind of their fam recent family history. And the reason for doing that was we wanted to frame questions to them about, w about events that we could, they might have taken pictures of, right? So, so we want to know, you know, where they'd been on vacation recently, you know, had there been any significant kind of weddings in the family? These are all kind of classic things that people, people take pictures of. Um, so here's an example, you know, we're talking to somebody and we found out how old their kids were. So we said, can you find a picture of your child's first day at school, right? Now, one of the things that we, we checked here was whether or not those were legitimate questions. Right? That's to say, did we ask them about something that wasn't in their collection or not? And there were no instances of where we asked them. So, so this, I didn't actually conduct this particular interview, but I guess there had been some previous conversation about the children going to school and stuff. Right. So, so that's how we set up the context. So these are all legitimate questions. Okay, your turn again. So how many, what percentage of pictures, you, Scott, you've done this already? Right, actually we've got more data from last time. Um, so, so how many, what percentage of pictures do you think people can find? It's a number between a naught and a hundred. <laughs> We've already had the naught answer, right? Any guesses? Fewer than they'd like to. <laughs> Good, yeah, that's the, right? So 100 percent is the, what they'd like to. And actually they had really high expectations, which I'll come to in a minute. But anybody, okay, so, so who thinks greater than 80 percent? Okay, who thinks less than 50 percent? Okay, well that's, it, 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 it's, it's like, so what we found was it's about 58%. And um, people are obviously very, very disappointed and surprised about this, but when we probe the reasons for this, there are various reasons when you actually look at what people do. So one of the problems is, these days, is we are taking many, many more digital pictures than we used to. So how many people have got a setting on their camera that just takes, mul we've got one that takes multiple pictures and you just pick the best one. You know, like this press photography kind of thing. Somebody's just invented a camera that's a buffer. Basically, it'll save, I don't know, is it, is it 10, I, I, anybody, is it 10 minutes? And it just buffers that interval. You say, I like that interval, saves all the pictures for that interval. It's just taking pictures the whole time, right? The point is we're actually over-generating here. Now, I don't know what the statistics are for analog pictures, but I think it'd be about like three rolls a year would be about average, right? So we've moved from, you know, it's an order of magnitude, from 100 probably to 1,000. So these people had, on average, over 5,000 pictures, and I consider that to be small, right? So we've got many more than we would actually think. The second thing is the people who did badly on this organized their pictures in, uh, you know, what we would say were kind of poor ways. So a lot of people had a completely kind of flat folder structure here, right? So they would have a pictures folder, and then they would just basically have a bunch of subfolders under that, and that would be it. The people who had sub-subfolders did rather better. But the reason, when we probe a, a little bit further about this, the reason why um, 
they didn't do better organization was this type of scenario, right? You're just about to go to the wedding or you're just about to go on holiday and you suddenly remember the camera's full. So you run upstairs or you run to the laptop, you plug in the USB, you dump it, you take whatever file that folder name the stick gives you, the software gives you, and you're done, right? And what you say is, whew, better get out of the house. When I get back, I'm going to organize that, <laughs> right? And, <laughs> and what happens, you know, so these are parents with young kids, and the answer is, it never happens. So then when we ask them to look for this stuff, they know it's in there because they perfectly remember taking these pictures, but it basically looks like random, random browsing to me. And if they've got a big stick, right, I mean, you don't know. If they've got a large memory stick, then, you know, there can be, I don't, I, you know, there can be thousands of, of photos that have been dumped in that kind of way. Um, and the point about false familiarity is that there's just an expectation that they're going to be able to do it because everybody says, oh, it's my stuff and those are my kids and that was our holiday, right? We just have a kind of false belief. And, you know, people think, oh, I'm really good at scanning pictures, which we all are, but, we're, you know, the scanning experiences that we have a lot, you know, in picture directories, are, you know, we tend to have experience of uh, kind of in the hundreds, whereas, you know, we're actually talking about the thousands here. And, and so we got a bunch of very depressed people completing this because, you know, they, here's something they've, they, they think they've invested a lot in. They haven't actually invested a lot of time in it in practical terms, but it's something very valuable to them, and they're just really depressed because we've shown them, you know, that at least some of them are wasting their time. Okay, so the last bit is if you look at work context, Sometimes when we do do organization, it may not have payoffs, right? Now, I'm not sure what the exact equation should be here, right? Because you could think about this as like insurance. You could say, um, well, you know, it's a one in a million chance that I want that file, but if it's a really important file and I've got it, right? But I don't know how, I don't know what, if, if, if the cost for that is spending your whole time maintaining a file system, you have to ask whether that's, that's a good equation. So I don't know, you know, we need a theory that, that looks at this. But here's some observations, right? Web bookmarks, and this is old data, but it's, a, it's still somewhat true, right? People spend a lot of time organizing stuff, right, in bookmarks. And we all know the most frequent way to get back to stuff is to search for it, right? Um, in email, this, again, this is older work. We know that people create folders that don't look too functional to me. Because, you know, basically, what you, it seems like what you naturally want a folder to do, somebody can make an argument, it's OK to have a fo folder with two. But, you know, when you start to get that sort of number, it's not cutting up the conceptual space for you. What you want folders to do is to contain a moderate number of objects of the same type. That cuts up your conceptual space for you. If you're creating lots and lots of these tiny folders, not only do you have to remember the labels, but every time you come to refile, you have to work out, oh, well, which one of those should I put this thing in? And what we found in that study was the more, fold, the, the, the more fail folders you had, the more likely you were to generate more fa failed folders, which supports that type of argument. And, and so, so what I'd argue is this is a kind of um, metacognitive problem, by which I mean that we don't know what we don't know what our futures are going to be like in, t in, in terms of consuming our, our information, so we don't do things that are very adaptive in, in terms of preparing for that future. And we can make both types of errors, right? We can collect stuff we don't need, and we can not collect stuff that we should need. What about organizing by date? I mean, you asked me for a photo, I know where it is because I know when it was taken. Sure, so, you're going to tell me. That's automatic. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm t I, d absolutely. Absolutely, but these, I'm saying these are ordinary people. They're not stupid people. They've probably, I think they all had degrees, but this is, this is the reality. So, so, I mean, I'll tell you, I've done this with computer scientists, and they all get their pictures in 40 seconds, right? <laughs> if that's, the, you know, per. What's, what's the fallacy? To think everybody's like us. There's some psychological fallacy. 
right? And I think that's a bit of... Right? Okay, so, you know, you could say, well, why should... This is, this is an argument that um, Sue Dumay has made, and I think it's a very interesting argument. You basically say, we shouldn't bother to organize because search is going to find everything for us. Um, now that, you know, we all know the story of search on the internet that, you know, first of all it was Yahoo and then basically nobody browses for stuff on the internet now. You know, it's gone from being like 40% browsing to I think it's about 8% of people browse for stuff now. Um, but we're talking about personal stuff. We're not talking about stuff on the web and I can discuss that difference if people are interested. So what we did in a study was we, we looked at people with their personal stuff some of which was kind of work-related stuff. And uh, we asked the question, how do you find stuff in your personal file stores? Right? And we're interested in whether or not people navigate for it or they search for it. And we had four different uh, search tools here. We had the Windows Dog. Um, you know the one I'm talking about? Yeah. Um, we had Google Desktop. And we had two versions of Mac. The Sherlock's the old one and Spotlight's the new one. Um, and I didn't get the chance to ask you about percentages to keep you awake here, right? But what we found was the percentage of searches is small. This is self-report data, but we did a separate study where we calibrated. So we asked people, you know, f f yesterday, how many t when you were looking for information, did you tend to navigate for it versus search for it? But we independently calibrated using log files the, the quality of those reports with actual behaviors. So I believe these data are accurate. Um, so most of the time, people aren't searching for that kind of stuff. Most of the time, what they're doing is navigating. The remainder is people who do stuff like uh, put those shortcuts on their desktop and, uh, and in files and things like that. What was quite striking to me, in particular with the Mac stuff, was um, that there was no difference in, in search behavior with the, those two versions of um, the Mac search engine. There was no difference, right? So I don't know how much money Apple spent in developing that software, but it's not, not led to a change in behavior. And here's the reason why, I think. That what we do is we only search for stuff when we can't remember where it is, right? So we had people report um, on those occasions, whether or not they could remember where the file was. So what we do basically with our own stuff in our file systems is, if we can remember, and we often can, because with our file systems as opposed to our photos, we're in and out of them the whole time, right? I don't know, I don't know how many people have looked at kind of event loggers, but you know, if, if, you're, if you're working on something, you're in and out of that directory the whole time, right? And that directory is kind of organically developing, right? Because you know, you'll, if you don't like the way it's organized, you put a, you know, you put a few subfolders in or whatever. So that's organized. And so you know where it is. And you all know the results where um, you don't know what the name of the folder is, but you know where it is spatially, right? And that's, an, you know, so, so these are kind of overlearned behaviors. So I don't think in the case of search, I don't think those numbers are going to particularly change. Is it like a, a picture of my first child's day at school? You know, what sort this, of this was like for that? this was more in the kind of files context, right? So, that, so it would be just like an every every day, you know, somebody would just be trying to find something they're working on. You know, I don't know whether you you know whether you're working on a you know a, a business report or a grant proposal or, or you know a paper or whatever a document for your manager, and we just ask them. How did you, you know, when you last needed to get to that, how did you get to it, <coughs> right? And so, you know, the query, if they do a query, might be the name of it, you know, um, yeah, probably that, that would be it. Just a, a, a regular kind of Google desktop type search would be if you use that technology. Okay, so, so this is a bunch of um, empirical work which is suggesting that this notion of just kind of capture, capturing everything is slightly problematic for various reasons. Some of the time, this digital stuff just seems to disappear. This digital stuff about our life just seems to disappear. 
On other occasions, we create these archives that we don't seem to be able to access. And then there are cases where we engage in behaviors of kind of preserving stuff that don't seem to be entirely functional. And for these types of desktop, uh, desktop objects, then we don't seem to be using search, even though it may be more efficient to use search, but this doesn't seem to be a human preference. So Steve, hmm. I'm, I'm not quite sure I buy the leap. I, I think you're entirely right that we rarely search today. I, I generally navigate. To you're going to tell me when it gets better, we're going to do it more. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's just from the data in the last slide. Yeah. It's not automatically true that search is good or bad. Right? The fact yeah. that you don't use it yeah. doesn't automatically say it's Absolutely. Good or bad. Absolutely. So, so I agree. And, and what, you know, what Sue Dune Dume says is, well, when it gets better, it's, it's good. Now, I was surprised at this data. So, I, I mean, I, I think the burden of proof lies with the proponents of search. I think there seems to be a surprising human preference to kind of grub around in stuff, right? And, and that's a preference. Now, maybe, you know, I, I don't, I, it was interesting to me. I haven't got Vista. So search is, you know, it's, it's kind of first class in Vista. Um, but watching a lot of people at Microsoft when I was last there who are kind of longer term, they seem to be people, although they're the wrong population for the reasons, yeah? But that, there seems to, that seems to be a natural way. So it's possible, but you know, we, have to do, we have to do the study to find that out, right? So I agree, this is not lo it's, doesn't logically follow, but I think, I think as I say, these are, there's, a, there's a surprising inertia in there. And I think we shouldn't be seduced by the, I think we're all seduced by the web experience, right? which is you'd be mad. You would be mad to browse on the internet, right? But in our own file systems, that's a completely different proposition. OK, so, um, so I want to talk about, um, so, so that was kind of, it was empirical, but it was, it was, it was kind of um, critical. So, so, so what I want to do now is I want to talk a little bit more about trying to develop um, principles that we might use for sort of doing this in a different way. And I'm using the term computer-mediated memory because I want to accentuate the point that whatever it is that we build actually has to fit with human cognition. Because we've seen all these, these kind of dirty problems that I've talked about earlier. They're associated with the fact that people use these types of technologies in ways that we couldn't have necessarily anticipated. So it has to be some kind of synergistic relationship between the wetware and, and whatever software it is that we build. So I just want to talk very quickly about uh, an experiment that we did, which was attempting to build a prosthetic memory for everyday conversation. And I want to make the point there that whatever it is that we build actually has to sit alongside human mem memory capabilities. And then I want to talk a little bit more about um, some kind of techniques and systems that we've built that have actually um, tried to develop ways to um, select, highlight, and privilege certain records, because that seems to be the problem. The problem seems to be that we've got far too much of this data. The question is how we actually sift through it and present things in ways that, that ordinary people will actually be able to access and use. Um, so I want to go through this, this fairly quickly, but this, this, is, this is kind of a, attacking another aspect of the, um, the kind of digital memory vision which is there seems to be an implicit assumption that these things are replacements for our organic memories. And there seems to be an implicit assumption, again, that people will always exploit this type of um, digital device when they're retrieving. Um, so, you know, you can just think about this, but, you know, if somebody said to you, um, yeah, in some context, they, they ask you for your address or whatever, you know, you don't say, oh, hang on, what's my address? I'll look at my PDA or look it up on my site. You know, you're basically going to answer that from your organic memory. So you can think, a lot of the time, it's, it's far less efficient to actually access these devices. Now, of course, you know, we can all think about cases where that's not true, but the point seems to be lost that there are cases when it's more efficient to use the, what's in your head. So we did uh, a very quick study which, um, That's right. Um, we did a study where 
the aim of the study was to give people a bunch of conversational memory tasks and we gave them different prosthetic memory devices, some from the old world like pen and paper, um, some kind of moderately old and some uh, more futuristic and looked at how they would actually retrieve, um, how would they, they would respond to memory questions depending on the properties of, of those devices. And um, the, the memory prosthesis we built um, was something called Chitty Chatty. And the way that this works is very simple. It's like note taking. But what you have that's associated with the notes is a speech or digital record. And clicking on a note will actually just retrieve that speech back with a little offset because it takes you time to think, write down your notes. Um, so we call this principle temporal co-indexing. And what we wanted to see was, what we wanted to do was to vary the properties of the prosthetic memory device. And we wanted to see what, how that affected how people answered memory questions. So our, our, organic, our organic memory is, as we know, often not accurate, but it's pretty fast. It's certainly fast compared with these other devices. Pen and paper is pretty fast to scan, as long as you haven't taken reams and read, uh, pages and pages of notes. A dictaphone, however, is accurate, but it's highly laborious to access information from that. What we hoped with our device was you could simply click on a note, you scan the notes very quickly, click on note, and retrieve the underlying speech. And I'll just, I, I won't run through the, the, uh, the details here, but I can't, sorry, I don't know happened to that. But let's see. Okay. Um, So what we found was that prosthetic memory, sorry, I missed a slide there. Okay. As we expected, the prosthetic devices, whether this is pen and paper, a dictaphone, or the chitty chatty, they're objectively and subjectively more accurate. Because if you think about it, if you have a dictaphone, if you could record everything I'd said in this lecture, then obviously, and it, it was important to be accurate about that, you would actually have an accurate record. And so this is what we found. And this is, so these are objective results, and these are subjective results. If we then look at efficiency, however, it's a slightly different story. So. These are the objective data. And what you see is these prosthetic memory devices, they're slower in supporting retrieval than organic memory with pen and paper being intermediate there. Now, the reasons, if you look at the subjective data, people are slightly deluded about how efficient um, our prosthetic memory chitty chatty device was, because I think they were thinking more about um, the fact that it was it was relatively accurate. So, now, and this is the most important point about this study, what we found was that use of the device was not only affected by the device properties, but also how good the person thought their memory was in that particular instance. So what the slide shows along the x-axis is people's confidence in the fact um, that they would be able to remember this information. So basically what it shows is if you're very confident you'll be able to remember something, you're not very likely to use a device, right? Now you say that's a completely obvious point, but I haven't read this in the literature on digital memories, right? So whether or not you, you know, so we can create these you know, huge, huge repositories, but whether actually they get invoked depends very much on how good people think their own memories are. Oh, yeah. So the other thing that we looked at is um, the trade-offs between efficiency and accuracy. And what you can see is a prosthetic memory device that is both efficient and accurate, namely the chitty chatty, 
is more likely to be used than one that's just purely accurate or one that's just purely efficient. Right? So if we vary the device properties, we change the likelihood it'll be used. Now, it doesn't appear to be, and what's happened to this plot, but basically um, what we found was that the pen and paper, <laughs> namely something that was efficient but inaccurate, was actually used more than the dictaphone, even though that slide doesn't appear to show it. Yeah. So I was curious, for your study, how did you account for, I guess, fluency and familiarity with the different technologies, such as with the chitty chatting and the dictaphone? Did you have sort of a burn-in period, or...? So, so the, the chitty chatty is not a difficult technology to use, right? Um, certainly, our, our experience with, it, with trying to teach people, it's, it's normally a two or three minute setup period. So basically, you have to say, you just take notes how you regularly take notes, right? And then, by the way, you can, re you know, if you click on one, you can retrieve it. A dictaphone, I think all of us is familiar with how a tape recorder works. So people are familiar with that technology. And in a sense, um, you know, I guess you could argue both ways whether it's better to have the technologies be too hard or too easy. But I certainly don't think that people were influenced by, for example, a lack of practice with using, with using a dictaphone in terms of um, using it to access information. And, and certainly our data would, the least familiar of all those technologies would be the chitty chatty. So you would argue if your assertion is correct, that would be the least likely to be used. So I, I, I would actually anticipate that, you know, the graphs, if there was, if there was an effect of lack of fluency or facility, I think it would have worked against us rather than for us in the, in the context of this graph. Okay. So I think I know what was going on there. So I think we'll try this. Okay, so I just want to very quickly sum up that part, and then I'll just uh, allude to some of the, I'm going to finish about five minutes, something like that, yeah, okay. So, so the point I want to make about this is we don't always use prosthetic memory. It depends on how good we think our own memory is. It depends on the device characteristics and something else I haven't talked about. Our organic memory decays over time, right? And so, for example, what you see, how many people have had the experience of taking notes and not being able to understand what those notes meant, right? Well, what we, what we found in this study was that people are pretty good at working out what the notes meant after a week, but not after a month. So what you see is an interaction between, if you like, the cue and the underlying memory trace, right? So these devices are going to have different uh, pro use profiles depending on how strong the original memory is. Okay, but the point to make in this context is we have to think about these things synergistically. We have to think about how the human memory is working in alliance with the device, and we have to think about the device properties and not that people automatically think about invoking the device. Okay, so what we've been trying to do um, in, in terms of developing other technologies is, is to try and think about how we might look at psychological principles in order to analyze um, or identify the types of events from all this data that we're recording that might be salient or significant for people. And we're influenced by um, John Anderson's work, who basically argues that, in a sense, memory is adaptive. So the things that we remember are the things that we should remember in evolutionary terms. So, you know, you know this statistic, what's the best predictor of the New York Times headline tomorrow? is New York, New York Times headline today. And that's something about the distribution of events in our environment. If something's just happened, it's likely, in general, it is likely to happen again, right? If something happens a lot, it's likely to happen again. So what, we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to use these types of principles for trying to uh, analyze this event stream to f try and find things that uh, may be salient to people. And so we have two approaches to this kind of adaptive selection, some of which we characterize as being attention-based. So the notion here is if a person pays attention to something in their environment, we're going to promote that in terms of being something they are likely to remember. 
So you can think about the chitty chatty. You're taking your notes there. There's a kind of theory that you have there, which is that if you pay attention to this, what's being said by taking some notes, you're likely to be able to remember it at some point in the future. You can think about pictures as being a kind of naive theory of memory. What you say when you take a picture is, I'm taking a picture of this event because I predict that at some point in the future I will want to remember it. Right? And one of the things that these automatic digital cameras are kind of screwing up is they're actually breaking that relationship somewhat because in a, in a sense they're actually over-generating indices for us. But we can do the same thing after the event. So we can say if somebody previously, if somebody retrieves something multiple times, we should also privilege that. Right? That's something that happens frequently and presumably that's important. You access it. So that's something that we should also uh, promote. And I'm not going to talk about this content-based analysis, sorry, Patrick, um, where basically what we do is we try and use information retrieval techniques to automatically analyze um, uh, records of the event stream. OK. So I've already said this. We can actually select these types of events by using events that the user engages in in order to prepare for future uh, retrieval. So we're doing some stuff where we're developing software um, which allows students to index a lecture course. So in this, in the con in this type of context, what we allow students to do is to, t is to use a device like that or a digital camera to take photographs or to take notes about events that they think are significant. Then we share those, we upload those, and we use those and as an index for all students to be able to uh, retrieve that information. So here's an example. Just like you saw with the Chitty Chatty, these are notes from one of my courses. You can just click on the notes, and you can retrieve that later on in the course. And I won't talk. We've shown that this, this stuff's functional. It, it, it works. What we're now looking at is extending this to the social case. Right? So one of the problems with our individual memories is that in this type of context, there's a lot of complex information coming your way. The kind of tags that you generate may not be appropriate tags. So maybe if we can actually combine indices across multiple users at both storage and retrieval, let's say we can have multiple indices, but we can also compare you know, the routes that multiple people take to retrieving this. Um, then we can actually start privileging certain of these events. So what we do with the current system is, here's a bunch of pictures that people took about one of my lectures, just using a digital camera. They're timer indexed in the same way that the chitty chatty time index things. And what something being bigger means is multiple students have used that as an index to retrieve this stuff. And what we can show is, We've just done a study where we compared this version of the system with a kind of asocial version of the system where there's no social feedback in. This one's the one that's predominantly used. Um, and also, if you look within a particular record, then there's a strong preference for picking big things than small things. Right? That's to say, within systems, people prefer the social. And then within indices, people prefer the social. Now, it could be just that this is more salient, but I guess that's the way we've designed it. OK, so I'm not going to talk about the, um, the, the meetings analysis stuff we do, but I'm quite happy to talk to people about that afterwards. So what I hope I've shown you is that we need to get away from just thinking about this as a capture problem. Right? It's not just enough to store everything. There are now various problems associated with digital archives. They're invisible, they're inaccessible, and they're hard to organize. In terms of design principles, I think we need to think hard about human capabilities, and we need to think about the relationship between these types of technologies and human memories. So instead of saying, let's capture everything, let's think about trying to develop applications for when organic memory is poor. And it can be dispositionally poor. We all know that people in general are bad about remembering intentions. That's why we make to-do lists all the time. We forget to go and pick up the milk. We forget what we're supposed to go to the supermarket for. We also know there are particular populations, like aging populations, 
And we know that they have problems in remembering uh, intentions too. But we can also look at things you know, within a, an individual where you know that recent stuff you're going to remember well, older stuff you're not going to remember as well. So we should be thinking about trying to target weaknesses instead of this kind of blanket approach. We should also think there about the person's perception of how good their memory is, because that's going to affect whether or not they use the devices we build. And then I've talked about the need for selection, albeit rather briefly, about how we can actually, if we start being able to, in a sort of ubicomp type way, being able to track user actions and treating those as mechanisms for or, or indices of attention, then we can start stamping onto the event stream and trying to see on, on learning what types of events may be important um, for individuals at retrieval and also how we can actually combine multiple indices of these kind of attentional indices. Um, and as I say, we've done some work on uh, the intrinsic semantics of, of events as well. Um, I've talked mainly about retrieval here, but there are other types of memory experiences uh, that we should think, and we'd probably want to build some different systems to do this. Okay, and we also need kind of more different types of models um, for uh, these other types of situations. So I'm sorry I've gone on too long, but I'm happy to take questions. You've had one question already, right? Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Um, I had a thought about the, back to the, like remembering the first day of school. Um, if you have a system where everything's organized chronologically, then in effect knowing the date that something happened just gives you that automatically. And so um, if you have all the information recorded, wouldn't that take away the issue of accessing it? Well, um, it's, I think it's an empirical question as to whether or not those, certainly in the recent past, well, so the psychology says people are bad at remembering absolute dates, right? That's a fact, right? What people are good at is putting events together. So you can say something like, um, oh, I know that must have been before that because that's when I did this other thing. So I think absolute timestamps may, as a proxy, be useful. But I think, I think the opportunity, especially with things like pictures, is to see how much metadata the technical opportunity is to see how much metadata you can get in there. And certainly with photographs, we're not getting enough metadata in there um, in terms of what we could have in there. So, you, you know, you could have all sorts of locational information in there. You could carry out web searches based on that locational information and generate meta, uh, metadata that kind of way. So I don't think the date's going to do it for us, but I think that the approach of, of actually trying to enrich the data set you have there will, will help people. Who was next? Comment on um, human memory. It's actually probably better than you think, at least <laughs> yeah. for most people. You give them more time. Like, if you tell yourself, well, I need to recall that. Sure enough, it always shows up too late. And even when it's already irrelevant, whatever. But it's there, predictably. It's some random time period. It's not a predictable time later when it comes out, but it's predictably there some, at some point. Yeah, Most I don't, people don't quite agree with that, but if they, if they think about it later on, they find it's actually true. Well, that's certainly, I mean, the tip of the tongue phenomenon is, yeah. you know, if you can't get it now, just wait around for a bit and, and, and it'll pop up. I don't know, you have to wait too long, but <laughs> once it comes later, it's, it's hard to predict when. Yeah. Well, I don't have a strong perspective on how bad human memory is. I think the proponents of this perspective have a much stronger uh, version on that. I'm just, my perspective is merely that you shouldn't ignore what's inside the head when you're trying to build these technologies. That's, so the more. You could go back later when you have your access point. Go back in. That would be useful. Chris, just because you study, you have these two dimensions of accuracy. Efficiency, yeah. Efficiency, and when I think of it, I, it's a dimensional space, which separates out retrieval efficiency from effort it takes to record. Right. And that's not just efficiency in the yeah. simple sense, but how much it distracts you to do it while you're doing it. It seems that that's a primary dimension in what you choose to do. Absolutely. So, so I, th I think that if, if you think about some of these classroom tools, that if you talk to students, I mean, and this is true of meetings as well, right? 
If you talk to students, the main problem is a kind of divided attention problem, which is just, you know, oh, I'm getting this down, and I've got to get it down coherently, because otherwise the note becomes meaningless. But in the act of doing that, you're actually distracting yourself from the next point that the, the instructor might be making. So I, I think that's a real problem. And you can see that as well. This is why I think, I think we need a new kind of frame. I think you can see that as well in the email type studies or even in kind of management of your file system or your photographs, right? So, you know, you need to think about what, is this going to be worth it? Is it going to be worth me saving all this email and, you know, creating a nice folder structure? You know, well, the answer is it, it depends because it depends on how important that information is for you. And I don't think, I, I think we need, I agree, that is an important dimension, but I don't think we've got the kind of rubric of the model straight yet, but I agree, yeah. Yeah. Well, I had a, um, a question about um, going back to searching on the web mm -hmm. versus your own folders. Um, could we argue that perhaps the reason we are more comfortable uh, with searching on the web and the reason we do it is that the web is something like alien for us, is not is, is a territory we're not familiar with, as opposed to the folders that I'm making. I mean, I'm the creator. <coughs> That's why, like, a cognitive thinking of searching, because I'm thinking, why should I search? I mean, I, I was the one who created it, as opposed to web. I mean, I don't know what's out there, so to speak. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. And, and certainly, the, so I talked about social tagging. I mean, one of the problems with um, other people's organizational structures is they're never actually quite as good as your own. I mean, I think you can make a cost. Yeah, you're making a, a sort of general efficiency argument. But, I think that's certainly true. The other thing to think about with the web is that the difference between the web and your personal stuff is, you know, a lot of the time when you're, you're, you're trying to get stuff out of your, your personal archive, you're not saying, get me, get me something general on X, right? Get me something general on compilers. Well, no, right? You're actually, you're, most of the time you're saying, I need a particular document. There's only one document that will do it for me. So. In IR terms, it's known item retrieval. And I think in those cases, people actually take more conservative strategy. That may be, and this is purely post hoc, people may take much more conservative strategy to finding that. Cause, but on the web, you know, it's kind of, it's higher risk, but you know, after all, you know, you're not expecting as good quality in, in terms of the results that come back. But that's pure speculation. But it's different, that's certainly true. So why don't we go back to the, the accuracy Slide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was looking at that, and what seems interesting is that different media have different structures of uh, accuracy or efficiency. So, oh, uh, back to your your check in X. Slide. Oh yeah. yeah. Sorry. I, 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 what happened is somebody else gave this talk, and they put the timestamps on, right? And if you copy, and and so you can't seem to, I can't seem to lose them, right? This is like a copy of a copy of a copy. But anyway, that's just. Oh, go on. Yeah, fixing PowerPoints is a whole other research. Topic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, so anyway, why, why are you finding? So the, yeah. the the idea was that there we go. Yeah. Uh, so some of these things we've labeled as accurate. We've labeled everything binary as accurate or not and efficient. Yeah. Or not. And, started, and you made an interesting comment, which is that. Pen and paper, the accuracy or the efficiency is proportional to the amount you've written yeah. down. So if I got three items, yeah. pen and paper is real efficient. Yeah. And so I wonder if in the same, you know, in, in algorithms designed in computer science, we say things are, you know, order log n mm. or something like that. And I wonder if you could write down the, the computational complexity at the sentence of, of each of these four things. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I can't because I'm not a computer scientist, but it, yeah. Well, I mean, right, just intuitively, you know, pen and paper is linear in the, in the the, the efficiency is linear in the amount of stuff you've written. Uh, and for dicta, you know, for chitty chatty, it's because that a slightly different structure to it. It'd be interesting to, to reason through it. Well, pen, in, in terms of the, so chitty chatty should behave like paper. It should be exactly the same way as paper, right? Um, the dictaphone, it's, it's something like half the length of the record, right? If you think about it, right? Because what you've got to do is, you know, if you think you're searching through a speech record, it's just real time unless you're using speed up, right? And half the time, you know, the, the average time you're going to find is half the length of record. Well, except that you would 
do have memory of long ago. That was sort of toward the end. So you, you do have practice. memory of speech. Yeah. yeah, well, actually, we've got some data that memory of speech isn't particularly helpful um, because it's got no inherent structure. So people think, oh, um, you know, that it, I seem to remember. So if it's, not, if it's voicemail data, you know that the telephone number is going to be at the beginning or the end, normally the end, right? That's OK. But if, if for other types of facts in there, people's, people's memory of whether or not they've been in a particular place in the audio is very poor. So we have some data that actually, if people use this kind of scanning method, they do worse than if they just play from beginning to end. So, you know, that's plot if people don't learn to lip read, would ever learn to interpret waveforms if you were some from clusters, you could get an idea of what it was. So you get the back some aspect of paper. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that's a whole. We've done a whole bunch of stuff, which is basically transcribing speech using ASR, forgetting about the errors, and then we can just do all this text processing on the speech. So we don't even need to go with waveforms. We can just do. Well, I'm saying some like waveform is useful for, because you might remember how the dynamics of a meeting oh, that, whatever. Yeah, that, that, that may be, but I guess, have you seen much with that, Probably Patrick? Not. This is speech recognition. It's sort of old-fashioned analog way of thinking about it. Yeah, I just, want, I just want the text. I I'm know. Not, I'm not too bothered about it. <laughs> yeah. At least Schreiber did that work in like finding hotspots. Yeah, yeah. But that's not, I mean, that's kind of been difficult to replicate, hasn't it? I mean, it's interesting, but it's been, and there are, there are theories like laughter is a good predictor, uh, rapid turn taking in meetings. So, so I think you can, you know, in domains, you can actually build up um, theories about when particular acoustic properties are predictive, but I don't think there's a general Just sort of, metric. Yeah, yeah. Or some other yeah. subset of metrics. So you, you both pose this strongly in a retrieval uh, scenario, though, though at the end you mentioned something of some, some subtopics that might reflect more on the structure of the memories. Uh, going to the world photo situation, uh, it's part of the charm of looking at old, old photos is, is then, then looking at you know, the clothing that, that your child wore on the first day to, to, to school, and which, yes, I remember that outfit, but otherwise, without that photo, it would have been one of those things that was submerged and, and irrefutable. Uh, or, or the paper that, that, you, that you wrote and had some just really great phrases that you otherwise wouldn't Yeah, isn't that weird? Isn't that weird when you go back and look at stuff and, that and, you just and, think you would never have remembered it? Right? And, and the, immediacy, the immediacy is one wonders why the connection wasn't there. It was in me all along. So the, maybe the more general question mm. is, is really the structure of objects, the variability, the very variegation of, of the, the thing that's being remembered, even if it is a recall situation, uh, let alone a larger context like perhaps a learning situation. Do you have any I think that's more like a that's, a, that's a question for a psychologist of memory, and I don't think they generally give answers to that type of question. But it's, it is, it's certainly true that there are unpredictable <coughs> relations between the Q, so they talk about the Q and the N-gram, right? And w w what, what happens often is that the, the N-gram gets degraded, but somehow or other a particular Q can trigger aspects of the engram. But I don't think, if I re I've read that literature recently, and it's not, it's not there yet in terms of, it's, I, I would not say that there was a principled literature in that area. So I think all we can say is that we know that there's a relation there, we know that the engram's decaying over time, and we know that the relationship between the, the Q and the engram, you know, the, the, the weighting, is shifting over time, right? So short term, you know, you can be all engram, if you like, you know, and still remember, you know, everything that your daughter was wearing. But over time, you can become more reliant on the cue for actually triggering that. But, you know, there are, if you've read this literature, and you've, uh, we've all had these experiences of strange triggering, right? You know, you're in a place where, you know, maybe you haven't been in this place for 10 years, and suddenly this whole you know, triggering experience comes back, and that's just not well understood. So then there's a question here is how does that relate when, when it's sitting on top of a, a query result mechanism? Uh, 
what, what are what are beneficial ways of uh, relating you mean, so, so, so take what we can kick back automatically and try and think about enriching that in some way is yeah. that then yeah. well I think if we understood the processes <coughs> I, I'm sorry to give a kind of bad answer but I think if we understood the processes better than then which we don't psychologically I think but but I, I guess one strategy certainly might be to think about um, multimedia or metadata and, and, and trying to think about um, presenting metadata maybe more in, in more kind of human type terms. You know, so instead, you know, instead of saying, oh, well, this picture was taken with this, this kind of F stop, you know, say, you know, you were this far, you can say you were this far from the picture or you know, instead of saying you're in this, pointing in this direction when this picture was taken, you could maybe say it was in this, you know, it was taken in this area, and maybe you could supply other pictures from that area, which need to have been taken by that person. They could, you just get them off the web or something like that. So I think that once we have the metadata, we can, we can bring in other things to enrich that experience, but I don't think it's predictable in human terms. I just don't think it's predictable whether or not we'll actually be able to get you know, that, that sort of full n-gram experience back again. Sorry, I mean, that's not a great answer, but... For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.